OK, uh, thanks. Uh, Kwang, today we are talking about uh, Wu Zetian, the son of heaven, but uh, she is a female. OK, so uh, we don't know which you call uh, daughter of heaven or son of heaven. And I will let uh, Kwang start it. Kwang, uh, please. OK, so hi, everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon. So my subject today is, as Jason said, Wu Zetian. She is the only impress of China, the only impress in the sense that she was the only female who created her own dynasty. And not only the wife of an emperor or the empress dowager for a son, she was also a wife for an emperor, and she was impressed dowagers for two of her sons, but she created her own dynasty too. Um, so impressed Wu Zetian means uh, Wu, her family name, in accord of heaven. That is a name the Chinese use to refer to her for the time period when she ruled as the sovereign of her own dynasty, and she used the name of the Zhou dynasty, Z-H-O, the royal house, uh, having ruled from 1046 BCE to 256 BCE. Once again, she created that own dynasty, and not as the impress consort of her husband, Emperor Cao Zong of the Tang dynasty, or the Empress Dowager of her sons of the same Tang dynasty, having ruled from 618 CE to 907. So she decided to bring back to life the sacred, river and unique name of a royal house of ancient times, which ruled, as I said, from 1046 BCE to 256 BCE, the Zhou dynasty. So her own dynasty lasted from October 17, 690 to February 21, 705. So it lasted for about 15 years, almost 15 years. She was born as Wu Chao, Wu being the family name, and Chao was her given name. Her give, given name means the shining one. She was born on February 17, 624, and she died on December 16, 705. So she lived to 81 years old. Later, she decided to change her given name with a character she invented for herself, but also pronounced Chao, but written differently. That special character that she invented for herself had the sun, the moon, the emptiness, but here emptiness has to be understood not as absence of things, but rather full of things according to the Buddhist uh, doctrine and the symbol for the earth. So all, all the symbols of heaven and earth in her new given name she created for herself. So we have to understand the character created by her. You can see the sun and the moon over vacuity. Vacuity, once again, is not emptiness, but rather under understood as all encompassing, all realizing, and pure total awareness, a fundamental Buddhist notion, thus, this can be understood as being in everlasting dance with phenomena or being and phenomena. In other words, total reality. Why did she insist so much on Buddhist theology? Because let's not forget that the Chinese empire was an empire rooted in Confucianist ideology. In Confucianist ideology, it's not possible for a female to be emperor. So she used the Buddhist ideology as the framework justifying her elevation 
to the imperial status in an autonomous ma manner and not only as once again the consort of an emperor or the empress dowager of uh, her sons. Uh, there's an, a, a book written, I don't know if, I don't, I, I don't think it's very clear, but just too bad, okay? Uh, a book written by Harry Rothschild and the title is Emperor Wu Chao. And in that book, he elaborated a lot about the ideological justification using Buddhism and uh, even Taoism precisely as the framework justifying her elevation to the imperial status within a nation permeated by Confucianism. Once again, she is notable for being the only female emperor in the history of China. For 15 years, she took the title Huang Ti, and Huang Ti is really only for male emperors, and the title has never been used by no woman before and after her. As impressed consort, the Chinese word with the wife of Emperor Kaozong of the time. meaning impress, and as impress dowager, she was Huang Taihou, meaning precisely impress dowager for her two sons, Emperor Chongzong of the Tang Dynasty and Emperor Ruizong of the Tang Dynasty. She, we can consider that she was practically the ruler of China from 665 to 705. Her husband would die in 683, uh, but he was quite sickly and not very dynamic. So she was assisting her, uh, assist, assisting him, I'm sorry. And uh, she was practically the ruler from 665 to his death in 683. Uh, she was the impress consort for her sons, uh, Chongzong and Ruizong, between 683 the year his, her husband died, and 690, the year she decided to create her own dynasty. Uh, for those who read the novels of Robert Van Gulik, uh, you might know a character called the Judge T. Uh, and that Judge T was not only an invention by the novelist Robert Van Gulik, but was also a true historical character of Tang Dynasty China. And it was that Di Renjie who convinced Wu Zetian to give back the power uh, to the Tang Dynasty for a religious reason. Because if she decided to give the empire to her nephews, the sacrificial ceremonies that would be given to her would not be as elaborate and as lavish that the ceremonial ceremonies that would have been given to her by her sons and grandsons. So it might sound a little bit funny for us nowadays, but it was based on that religious reasons that she would benefit from more religious respect after her death that she decided according to uh, after the Ranjie persuasion to give back the empire to the Tang Dynasty, meaning to her two sons uh, who were demoted during her reign from 690 to 705, and to restore them, first Chongzong Zhong, Chong as emperor, and second Ruizong as emperor. And uh, Ruizong is the father of the Red Emperor Xuan Zong, who will rule later on uh, during the first one of the Golden Ages of China. But the rule of Xuan Zong uh, is probably the central uh, focus of that uh, Golden Age, um, having lasted from 712 to 700 and to 55. 
Chang'an, meaning the everlasting peace, was the capital city of the empire and was cosmopolitan to the core with consider considerable foreign population and ranked together with Constantinople and Baghdad among the most glorious cities of the world at the time. It is an understatement to say Buddhism, one of the three major teachings vitalizing Chinese civilization with Confucianism and Taoism, thrive tremendously under her imperial sponsorship. The arts also flourish, of course. Uh, the printing press started with the woodblock printing or xilographic technique in China in the seventh century under her reign. And the oldest uh, book that has been kept and exists nowadays is a copy of the Sutra Diamond, which has been printed in six in 868 AD. The printing press with movable type in clay or porcelain would appear in China in the 11th century, 400 years after Wu Zetian, okay? Because the woodblock printing is not exactly the same than the movable printing technique, which is the modern printing technique. It was also a first for the whole world when the movable type of printing press will appear in China in the 11th century. And I know that it's about the Tang Dynasty and Wu Zetian, but I just want to mention the name of the inventor of the movable type printing press. And his name is Pi Sheng, B-I, his family name, and Sheng, S-H-E-N-G, his given name. He was born in 902, and he died in 1051. Uh, his name would have been lost for history if the scholar official and polymath Sheng Kuo had not recorded his name in his Dream Pond essays. And Sheng Kuo was born in 1031 and died in 1095. That being said, uh, let's go back towards uh, Tian and uh, Chang An. <laughs> Uh, Mark, Good, regular, regular. Uh, yes. do you want to take yes. a question now? You have something to say? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, what is the uh, modern name of Chang'an? Is is there a modern uh, city where Chang'an Xian. is? Xi. Okay, great. Yeah, I know the city. Okay, thanks. Xi'an is Xi'an. X I A N. You have uh, the soldiers in key of the first army. So, uh, with regular tree line avenues, high walls, pleasure parks, and areas dedicated to specific functions, Chang'an's layout influenced the city plan of several other Eastern Asian capitals for many years to come. It was a model that was copied meticulously, modern in Japan still retains the characteristic of Tang Chang and or modest scale. Uh, so you, if you go to Kyoto in Japan, you can see much was uh, present in the 8th century Chang An. At its peak in the 8th century, the city had the largest concentrated population on earth, about 3 million inhabitants. And if I compare the 3 million inhabitants, it's even more populated than the city in which I'm living now, Montreal, because Montreal is a city of about, of almost 2 million inhabitants. So going back to Chang'an in the 8th century, there was 1 million inside the city walls and another 2 million in the sur surrounding suburbs. London and Paris would only have 1 million inhabitants each a thousand years later in the 1800s. The Chinese people call her Wu Zetian when she presided over her own dynasty created by her, the Chao, from October 17, 690 to February 21, 705. And Wu Hou, meaning sovereign Hou, uh, so, sorry, sovereign Wu, were used for the time 
when she was impressed consort of her second husband, Cao Zong, who ruled from 649 to 684. Then she ruled from 655 to 683 as impressed dowagers for her sons by Emperor Chong Zong and Emperor Wu Zong, who ruled between 684 to 690, who were mere puppets in the hands of their mother. So Li Xian, who was born in 656 and died in 710, also known as Emperor Chongzong, Z-H-O-N-G-Z-O-N-G, ruled from January 23, 684 to January, February 26, 684, deposed by his mother in favor of a younger and more easygoing brother, Prince Tan, and that Prince Tan would rule as Emperor, Emperor Reizong. Emperor Chongzong would come back to power between 705 and 710. Li Tan, born in 662 and died in 716, also known as Emperor Ruizong, R-U-I-Z-O-N-G, ruled in inverted coma once again from February 26, 684 to October 17, 690, under the control of his mother. He ruled a second time from 710 to 712, abdicating in favor of his son, the outstanding Emperor Xuanzong, having ruled from 713 to 756. He lived six years after his abdication in his son's favor. Emperor Ruizong died in 716, three years after his abdication on July 30, 713. Nevertheless, it is when it is written in history, history books that Emperor Ruizong ruled from 710 to 712, we understand he ruled the whole year of 712, but not the whole year of 713. Emperor Ruizong was so laid back during his second reign that he let his younger capable sister, Princess Taiping, supervise everything. So the Taiping Kongchu or Princess Taiping was the last daughter of Wu Zetian. She was born after 662 and committed suicide at home on August 2nd, 713, because her nephew, Emperor Xuanzong, who did not inherit the relaxed disposition of his father, ordered her to do so, thus securing his imperial power. Princess Taiping's assets were confiscated, and it was said that there was so much treasure, livestock, and real estate that it took several years for the accounting to be completed. The period from 655 to 705 represents 50 years. I wrote above on Wu Zetian 40-year reign because for about the first 11 years of her rule, Cao Zong, her husband, truly ruled, and be it much assisted by his wife. After Cao Zong had a debilitating stroke in 660, Impress Wu became the administrator of the court, a position equal to the emperor's. So from 660 to 684, two thirds of the nominal reign of her husband, Wu Ho, Impress Ho, was the true ruler of the Chinese empire. Her art name is Glamorous Lady, Mei Niang in Chinese, bestowed upon her by her first husband. Emperor Taizong, who ruled from 626 to 649, father of her second husband, Emperor Kaozong, who ruled, as I said, from 649 to 684. It was, of course, an enormous scandal at the time because you understood that even if she was not the biological mother of Emperor Cao Zong, her second husband, 
from a religious and ritual, ritual perspective, Emperor Kaozong was her son. Shin, she was the wife of his father, Emperor Taizong. Empress Wu was 26 years old, 26 years younger than her first husband, and four years older than her second husband. There was no intimate intercourse between her first husband, Emperor Taizong, and her. And the answer is obvious concerning her second husband, Kaozong, and her, since they had children together. Therefore, to our modern minds, the scandal was more a ritualistic one, not a natural impropriety. But rituals were and are paramount in Chinese society. After all, rituals are the everyday expressions of ethics and morality. But ask yourself the question, if you are truly, madly attracted to a woman just four years your senior, albeit she has been wed to your dead father, and you are an emperor, what, what would you have done? Besides her political achievement, Wu Zetian also had a fulfilled family life. She had four sons. Two were emperors, and one was bestowed that rank as a posthumous honor. One of her grandsons was the glorious emperor Xuanzong, who ruled from 713 to 756. Here is a poem she wrote when in a nunnery just after the death of her first husband, as protocol demanded for all consorts without children. Longing for Prince Zhu, the second husband and Emperor Kaozong, now Emperor Kaozong, who was born in 649 and who died in 684. So here is the English translation of her poem, Longing for Prince Zhu. I miss you so much as living as if in a trance, ensnared by confused thoughts, mistakenly seeing red as green, my body haggard and feeble day by day because I miss you so much. I miss you so much but can't see you. My face washed with tears all day long. I send you a dress, my beloved, the pomegranate dress of the day we first met. If you don't believe me, open the box and look at the dress wet with my tears. Because uh, those two had a secret relations uh, during the when Emperor uh, Taizong was still alive. And uh, when she was sent to a nunnery as imperial protocol requested, uh, uh, the, um, the son, Emperor Kaozong, accepted the protocol and they waited, I think, for two years and a half to three years before Emperor Kaozong brought her back to the capital city and uh, will take her as uh, his wife. Of course, once again, it made it was an enormous scandal at the time. I stop here before going further because uh, the second part, uh, when I would use the marvelous maps that Jason prepared. And I will give a background on the general history of China at the time. But do, do you have any questions or comments uh, for that after that first 30 minutes? I have a question regarding uh, Wu Zetian's uh, birthday and uh, passing day, disease day. Yes. Um, is this translated to Western calendar? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, if I remember, she was born in February 17 and she died on December 16. Okay, February 17, okay. 624, and December 16, 705. And this is based, based on, on Western calendar? Yes, it is Not possible to make it. traditional calendar. 
Yeah, no, it's based on Western calendar because it's always possible to translate into the Western equivalent, uh, the data of the Chinese calendar. Uh, uh, Quang, I, 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 I know the year usually, <clears throat> but the months usually they use the Chinese calendar? Yes, it's possible to use the Chinese calendar, but uh, if you count precisely, you can have the, the exact uh, uh, moment in terms of month, in terms of day of the month. Because okay. as you know, there is a, uh, the Chinese calendar is uh, solely lunar and the uh, Western calendar is solar, but there is, it's possible to make uh, the equivalent very precisely. Yeah, let's move on. The, the calendar thing is like, <laughs> we can talk about hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have the Madeline and the Joe. Okay, Madeline, please. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Quan, for putting this together. It is such a huge amount of work uh, to do even one presentation. It's unbelievable. And thanks, Jason, for hosting. Uh, there were a couple of things I really liked a lot that you included. Um, one was the difference between the carved woodblock type and the movable type, because that's a, always a fascinating hinge in history, and uh, movable type is so different difficult in Chinese. Um, I did do the reading, or at least a lot of it in the Wikipedia article first. And um, I what I loved about her was she got these people to write a fake prophecy about her so that she would ha basically have the mandate of heaven. I just thought that was just amazing. And um, I, I just had to step away for one minute. Were you saying that Judge D of the uh, the fame of the, the novels, he's the one who suggested that idea to her? Absolutely. Well, uh, there's two things here. She had a small uh, uh, council of advisors who suggested her to use the Sutra of the White Cloud uh, as the religious legitimization of her as the mother uh, sovereign. Okay, so first, that is the political narrative that has been used, and the book by Harry Rothschild precisely elaborated a lot on that political narrative, uh, justifying her elevation to the imperial status. And about Ti Ren uh, he was uh, the advisor who suggested her to give back the empire to the Tang Dynasty so she would benefit from more lavish sacrificial ceremonies as the mother, the grandmother and great-grandmother, et cetera, of uh, the Tang princess, rather than being simply uh, having uh, less lavish ceremonies by her nephews in case she handed the empire to the Wu family. Wow, the whole thing, it's so convoluted. It reminds me of like the War of the Roses with all the different plotting and planning and characters and everything. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's interesting too, because the Tang Dynasty was the last dynasty where the women play a major role in politics. Because let's not forget that the Tang Dynasty was Chinese on the father's side, but Turk and Mongol from the mother side most of the time because the first Chinese emperors of the Tang Dynasty mar intermarry a lot with uh, proto-Mongol princesses and third princesses uh, in their first uh, century because let's not forget that the Tang Dynasty was from a group called the Guanlong aristocracy uh, created around the 5th and 6th century in Central Asia and it was a mix with uh, between the Chinese and the Turks and the proto-Mongol people. And the Tang Dynasty was truly a very cosmopolitan dynasty, having Confucianism and Chinese culture as a base, but also the power of the Turks uh, in military term. And I would say that uh, it was probably the most cosmopolitan dynasty of, of China. So uh, let me interrupt here uh, because uh, Madeleine talked about the Judge D, okay, Di Renjie, okay. So I want to uh, 
uh, make sure that the judge D, D Renjie is a real person, but the story from, uh, I, I forget what, who is the author, the story. Robert, uh, Robert Van Gulich. Yeah, it sounds uh, like a Sherlock Holmes story is not true. Okay. It's uh, not exactly, true. exactly. Yeah. But uh, uh, I'd like to announce you, I'm interested in that book. Is anybody want to uh, uh, talk about this book? And please contact me. I will be happy to have a section about the Judge D, just probably like one or two story. I think that would be interesting to understand how uh, Western view uh, Chinese uh, 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 history. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't know uh, if uh, there's two hands or three hands. Uh, I would let Jason decide the, oh, the yeah. order. Uh, let's I don't go, remember go. the order. Yeah, Joe, uh, CK, and Mark. Yeah, okay. no, I was just I, I just had a very quick question about the influence of Confucius and essentially the practices of Lee, because you mentioned a little bit about ritual, but actually you just answered that question. So I very much appreciate that. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then go to CK and uh, uh, Mark. CK, please. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. Uh, the Tang Dynasty, the um, rulers or the emperors of the Tang Dynasty had mixed ancestry, as Quan said. Um, the tribe that had most influence from a minority viewpoint of, for the Tang Dynasty would be the Xianbei tribe, because the... Uh, uh, the the mother of uh, I think Li Shimin had the uh, the surname of Du Gu, and her uh, and, and his empress had the surname of Zhang Sun, and even his uh, one of his prime ministers had the surname of Zhang Sun called Zhang Sun Wu Ji, and they were of very mixed ancestry. So the the one nomadic people that has had influence had great influence for the Tang Dynasty would be the Xianbei people. Yes, thank you for your command, uh, CK, and I would like to add something. Uh, in 616, the Tang general Li Jing uh, was victorious over the eastern Gokturk. Okay, Gokturk is written G-O-K-T-U-R-K. -K. And, and those the word Gok in turn could be translated loosely as blue or heavenly, okay, the heavenly Turks. And the Gokturn Empire uh, cover almost 10 million square kilometers. And when General Li Jing was victorious on the eastern uh, Gokturn, the Tang Dynasty Empire increased by about uh, three to four million square kilometers. And in 643, the emperor himself uh, was the leader of the army having vanquished the Western Gokturn and adding another uh, practically six to seven million square kilometers. And the emperor of China was also the Kagan of the Turk from 643 to 755. So it was the time that the Chinese empire reached its biggest or largest extent, meaning around 15 million square kilometers. And it was uh, the unique century when China was so large. And I stop here for my comment. Uh, uh, Jason, who is the next person? Mark or Mark, I think so. Uh, Mark. Mark. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanna make sure I understood what you said about um, the influence of women in the, the Tang Dynasty. So my understanding of what you said was that that was the last dynasty where women had a strong um, political influence. And my impression was that that was because of the influence of Turkish culture. And I think the implication was that at that time, women had a higher status in the Turkish culture than they did in the Chinese culture. I wanna make sure, is that right? Or were you saying something different? You understood perfectly, okay? Because within con Turkic culture, women are equal to men, politically speaking. Uh, not in the Chinese culture. Politically speaking, uh, women are subordinate to men, politically speaking, because of the Confucianist principles. And absolutely, okay? 
uh, the major role in politics by women in the, during the Tang Dynasty is because of uh, the presence of Turkic culture within the cosmopolitan Tang Dynasty. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. So if we have no more questions, and uh, Kwang, you want to continue? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would like to go to your your maps, please, Jason. You want to do this one, or I I show the world map. Okay, so uh, uh, personally, I think this one is interesting because you take the global view. Uh, you want to talk about this one or the other one? About no, I I think that you're perfectly right. Let's take the first one, okay? Because it's a very beautiful map that Jason prepared. And I think that it shows really, uh, well, I think that all, maybe not all of you, but those interested in geopolitics know that there is a there is a an expression used uh, in geopolitics uh, for the landmass that we see, and the landmass that we see uh, having Europe, Asia, and Africa together is called the World Island. Okay, and you have here an image of the world island around 750, uh, showing uh, the major world empires and polities uh, present at the time. And uh, 750 is also the last year of the Omayyad Caliphate, and Jason is right to have put Omayyad Caliphate on the map because it was their last year, and the next year would be the Abbasid Caliphate that would begin. So I suppose that Jason wanted to give a tribute to the last year of the Omayyad Caliphate, choosing the year 750. Uh, so uh, I think, the, so we can go to the next map, please, Jason. Okay, so uh, I, I mentioned the, the Gokturd Empire, the Eastern and the Western Gokturd Empire, and you see that uh, in yellow is the, the, the Tang Empire proper, so that it's about 6 million square kilometers. And the, the Gokturn, Eastern and Western Prime, if you put them together, it's quite close to 10 million square kilometers. And, and I said it's when between 743, 643 and 755, when the Chinese emperors was also the Kagan of the Turks, uh, China reached her largest extent uh, at the time, during that century from 643 to 755. Okay, uh, can we go to uh, another note? Uh, when, because of the military victory of the Tang Dynasty over the Gok Turk, Confucianism spread in Central Asia too. And it has a consequence that most people don't know. Uh, I don't know if you guys knew about a kingdom called the Khazarian Kingdom, K-H-A-Z-A-R-I-A, -A. Khazaria Kingdom or Khazarian Kingdom. It was a kingdom uh, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, uh, ruled by a Jewish king. And uh, that Jewish king, uh, uh, that person having be, that dynasty of king of uh, Turkic origin in terms of ethnic origins, but who converted to Ju Judaism and uh, who ruled that part between uh, Western, uh, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea uh, around 700 CE to 950 CE. Okay, that and uh, there was a lot also of uh, Confucianist uh, presence in that uh, kingdom uh, too. So maybe that is a kingdom that, that is less known, but that is to a certain extent related to the history of the Tang Dynasty or of the Chinese Empire at the time because of the victory of the Tang Dynasty over the Gok Turk. And what a part of the Gok Turk went west and that part of the Gok Turk created the Khazarian uh, kingdom. Okay, can we go to the other map or chart, please? Okay, so the famous Silk Road, of course, who has been opened by Chang 
Zhang Z H A N G Chang Qian Q I A N uh, who live uh, in the second century BCE uh, working for the Wu Emperor of the Han Dynasty uh, but of course it has been revived by the Tang Dynasty of course and it has been a major uh, a road for communication ideas and merchandise, of course, uh, for two millennia, uh, connecting the western part and the eastern part of the world island. Okay, please, uh, Jason, next map. Okay, uh, maybe not map, but chart, I think. Uh, okay, so you uh, exactly. The, uh, yeah, yes, no, okay. yes. And here uh, we, ca uh, we can have uh, a short uh, summary of the Tang Dynasty, uh, as it, you see foundation by Li Yuan or Kao Zhu in 618, Taizong area, the flourishing age or Chu Quan Chu Chu in Chinese, uh, the uh, government of uh, Chen Quan Chu Chu of the true vision because Chen Quan can be translated as true vision. So the government of true vision by Emperor Taizong, Li Shuming, between 627 and 649. The famous uh, Madame Wu Zetian, between 690 and 705, uh, her, with her own dynasty, the Zhou dynasty. The reestablishment of the Tang dynasty from 712 with Emperor Chongzong, the glorious golden age by with Emperor Xuanzong from 713 to 755. Uh, the Anshu Rebellion was uh, very serious and who, which undermined gravely the dynasty, having lasted five years from 756 to 761. Some historian would say 763, but I would say 761, it has been uh, pacified mostly. And uh, without entering into the detail, of course, the end of the dynasty in 700 and 907. So that dynasty lasted for practically three centuries. And it was a major uh, dynasty in the history of China and probably the most cosmopolitan of all the Chinese dynasties. Maybe the next slide. This one, the uh, 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 Wu Zetian's famous, famous. Yeah, exactly. We mentioned that she she had many sons with the Emperor Kaozong or Li Zhu. So uh, four sons: Hong, Xian, Xing, Xian, uh, Tan. The last one, five sons to be exact, and one daughter, Princess uh, Taiping, uh, who was. Uh, killed by her nephew, Emperor Xuanzong. She was born in 660 and she died in 713. And she was probably, except her interest, Wu, her, Wu Zetian, of course, the second most powerful woman of that dynasty. Uh, maybe the next slide, uh, Jason, please. Uh, okay, name and title, okay. Here, I was speaking of the uh, character she invented for herself, and uh, Jason put the character here. So you can see on the left side, the sun, on the right side, the moon, and the character in the middle is for emptiness. But here, emptiness is not absence of reality, but on the contrary, fullness of reality, okay? According to Buddhist theology. And under that, uh, and uh, the, the meaning is, is pronounced chao and it's, it can be translated uh, as shining or outstanding or uh, something uh, in that order. Okay, Jason, uh, do we still have another slide after that? Uh, oh. No, and uh, I, I think you, do you want to talk about the, okay. what is the before Tang Dynasty? I thought you want to talk about the background. Oh, you want to, that, let's take some question now. And before you go back to the, how does Tang Dynasty created? Uh, I'm sorry, I did not hear you. There was a problem of of, uh, of sound. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we probably let's take a a, a a question. If anyone has a question about the, uh, this period of time, you know. Yes. 
and then we can go back to how does uh, yeah the the entire history how how does Tang Dynasty fit in the entire history entire Chinese history? I think that's another important subject. Absolutely. So we have a uh, Madeline. Okay. Uh, may I ask you? Yes. Uh, Madeline, please. Yes. Um, I had seen that she was the one who instituted the uh, the examination system. Was she the one who started it? Um, it also said that she want she recommended that um, that uh, Lao Tzu be included in in the classics that had to be studied because now she claimed him as an ancestor. Um, was she the one who initiated the exam system, or did she reform it? Uh, she promoted the examination system because the examination system was created uh, on a massive scale. Okay, because let's not forget that even in the remote past, uh, during the Han Dynasty, for example, uh, there was small. How can I say it? A kind of examination system, but on a small scale. But the first time in Chinese history that you have the examination system in a big national scale or big impact scale system was with the first emperor of the Sui dynasty who start which started in 581 and that first emperor of the Sui dynasty was emperor Van Ti. so it started before her but she certainly contributed to expand the exa examination system because uh, she needed precisely to liberate herself from the landed aristocracy. Let's not forget that uh, uh, for the traditional aristocracy from China, uh, it is absolutely impossible for a woman to be uh, impressed by her own. Okay, So in order to liberate herself from them, she needed new blood within the government. And it is absolutely, it was absolutely in her favor to promote uh, the arrival of commoners as uh, bureaucratic assistants, and also uh, using the Buddhist theology uh, as a justification once again for her elevation to the imperial status, other than being the wife of an emperor or the mother. Of emperors. So, uh, Joe, please. Yeah, actually, you know what? He you did it again. Actually, the the main question I was going to ask is like, how did uh, her acceptance of Buddhism actually influence the the uh, the empire as a whole? Um, and just maybe just expand on it as to uh, uh, as to. Uh, we even had we had a good discussion about it the other night, but the idea of cosmopolitanism at that particular moment in time. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's not forget that uh, politics and religions are very intertwined, and uh, the promotion of Buddhism was not only the enthusiasm for the intellectual and spiritual. Uh, uh, legacy of Buddhism, which is outstanding, of course, but uh, there were political reasons who were the true engines of the expansion of Buddhism uh, un uh, under the Tang Dynasty, and it was a lot thanks to her, because let's, let's not forget that Buddhism arrived in China uh, during the first century CE, okay, so Buddhism arrived in China five centuries before Wu Zetian, maybe a little bit more. And there was a lot, and Buddhism has been absorbed by the Chinese, and the Chinese created their own Chinese Buddhism with time. So at, at the time of the Tang Dynasty, you already have a Buddhism that has been completely synthesized and uh, absorbed deeply by the Chinese. So the intellectual fervor, the religious enthusiasm was not enough to expand the, the, that religion within the Chinese empire, 
but it was the political motivation coming from Wu Zetian, which gave the impetus for Buddhism to be uh, so uh, present within Chinese society. Thank you. Okay. If Emperor Constantine, the Dick of Milan in 313, and did not uh, ask for the council of uh, Nicaea, uh, Christianity would not have expanded that within the Roman Empire. So the political factors always play a very big role. Yeah, since we talk about the Buddhism, that's one of my interests. Uh, my uh, one of my interests. So I, I would like to say, <clears throat> during this time, remember during uh, Wu Zetian's reign, right? Xuan Zhang, okay, just come back from India, okay, and he do a mass translation, and then uh, so I would say that's the peak time of Buddhism. And the political reason, Wu Zetian also had an incentive to uh, promote Buddhism because uh, Buddhism have the concept of reincarnation, okay? The Buddha reinborn. So since she cannot be the son of heaven, but she could be the reincarnation of one of the Bodhisattva, okay? So that would be uh, her interest. And then she also had the, uh, doing the Da Yun Jing, okay, translate and the commentary on that. And she has her own interpretation on this. So uh, regarding the uh, the Laozi, the Taoism, because th that's the reason is the family name is Li, which is considered the Laozi's last name, Li Er, okay, so, People think Li Er, the, uh, the author of the Tao Te Ching, uh, uh, is Li Er, so the last name is Li. So for this reason, the Tang Dynasty also see uh, uh, Taoism is important. So during that time, I will say the religious uh, uh, Buddhism is on the peak. And then later on, on Han Yu, Okay, that's why he, uh, that's a famous uh, neo uh, Confucian, uh, Confucian scholar. So he start to reject the uh, Buddhism and then uh, the story going on because he failed. He tried, and then, then we, to the next 200 years, to the Song Dynasty, uh, we have the neo Confucian that come out because they start to reject. Uh, Buddhism. So that's the complex history, but uh, it's related to Buddhism and uh, uh, Confucianism, the struggle between these two uh, uh, schools. Yeah. I'll stop here. Then we have uh, Alan and uh, CK. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Go uh, ahead. I, I try to close my own knowledge gap here. Um, I know Wu Zetian well, in the sense of learning from school history. My question to you is, uh, aside from the philosophical religious part of it, uh, in a male dominated power structure there, I, I'm looking for a brief explanation how she was able to accomplish this power grab completely in the sense she was not only the regent, but she changed the name of the dynasty from Tang to Sui, uh, to Zhou for 15 years. Uh, that's not a trivial thing to do. That's Absolutely. my question. How, how did she accomplish that briefly? Yes, briefly. And I'm very grateful for your question because uh, there are many, many answers to that question. First, I want to say that love is the most important answer, okay? Because Wu Tian is the product of three laws. First, the love of her father. Her father was a wealthy merchant of wood and uh, he, he has been granted the title of Duke of Wu 
But he was a bit looked down by the Tang aristocracy because in that very close milieu, everyone knew that he was a merchant from the origin, that he was not from the military aristocracy. And at that time, only military aristocracy is, was perceived as true aristocracy, of course. And because of that, he gave a an education to his daughter, Wu Zetian, as if she was a boy. And when she has been sent to the imperial court to be chosen as a consort of Emperor Taizong, she has been selected because Emperor Taizong been quite old at the time and did not fail in, fall in love with her in a mad manner, but uh, he was impressed by her because let's not forget he was uh, an old man of uh, 50 years something and she was uh, 13 or 14 years old at the time let's not forget so uh, he has been quite amused by her petulance and her uh, sc scholarly manners because she has been quite well educated by uh, the tutors uh, that her father hired for her so that was the second love. And the third love, of course, was the mad love that, that Li Chu, Emperor Gao Zong, had, uh, Gao Zong right, had for her, her husband. That's the first step of her power graph, if I may say so. Three levels of love, because love is a powerful uh, stuff in life okay let's not forget for example that the wife of emperor uh, justinian of the eastern roman empire started in life quite low and uh, as the almost a prostitute and she managed to become empress of uh, the eastern roman emperor empire so the first step was those three laws and the second step was that she was bright enough well it was second step it was her husband, Emperor Cao Zong, was quite sickly, okay? So he began to rule from 649. During the first 10 years of his rule, he was the true master because uh, he was healthy during that first 10 years. But from 660, because of the stroke he had, uh, he was not really capable to attend court to sessions and to discuss with his minister and generals on a regular basis, okay? Let's not forget that to be ch a Chinese emperor is a hard working person. So he was not at all capable because of the state of his health at the time to uh, respect that uh, hard working schedule. And Wu Setian, because of the good education that she received from the tutors her father gave her, was perfectly capable to read the official documents and to write uh, the answers for her husband. And he was uh, easygoing enough to accept her to replace him and even to give her the official title of court, court administrator, uh, which is a very high title, almost equivalent to the emperor. Let's say regent would be a nicer sounding word. It's from 660 to 683, the year of his death, meaning practically for a quarter of a century. So during all that time, 23 years, she had the time to build her own uh, followers, uh, if you want. Okay, uh, Many bureaucrats have been admitted to power thanks to her. And the fact that she promoted a lot the imperial exam system at the time from 660 to 683 uh, gave her the opportunity to gain the gratitude of many bureaucrats from humble background who will assist her in the power grab in 690. And the third factor is Buddhism, of course, that would use uh, that she would use. Uh, liberally to give a justification, a religious and spiritual and metaphysical justification to her elevation to the imperial status. And the fourth factor that I want to name, let's not forget that the capital city of Chang'an 
was the seat of imperial power. She managed because she managed to gain the support of many bureaucrats of humble backgrounds that she brought to power. They managed to transfer the capital city from Chang'an to Luoyang. And she was in her city in Luoyang. And it was another factor which facilitated the power grab. So it was an incredible, an incredible human adventure. But when we examine that, uh, that uh, how can I say it? When we examine those steps, it was logical. She was bright enough to play the circumstances and the people in her favor. And et voila. Okay, thank uh, We have uh, CK and uh, Joe. Yeah. Well, to follow up on what Quan just said, uh, Emperor, because I think she's deserved, she should deservedly be called Emperor. Uh, Wu Zetian was Machiavellian before Machiavelli. Uh, she was able to utilize the Buddhist idea of uh, the eternal return by claiming that she was the reincarnation of uh, the Maitreya Buddha, the Mila Four, and therefore she could therefore ascend uh, uh, the uh, the empressship to become the to 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 assume the mandate of heaven. Um, I want to bring up a, a kind of a, a, an observation when I look at this this slide that is uh, shown in front of us right now. I see that every dynasty has its name until 1900 Republic of China by Sun Wen. And after that is 1949 without any name. So is that deliberate or is that just accidental or is that a Freudian, Freudian slip? I'm just uh, a little amused by that. Uh, you're right to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to say that because I, 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 I copy from somewhere, okay, so uh, uh, that I just mark some of that. Oh, you talk about uh, CK, you talk about I mark the dynasty, but I start to mark the dynasty after that? Oh, uh, yeah, and after 1900, after the Republic of China, it's just the portrait of uh, Mao Zedong in, say, 1949. It's, oh, okay. there's, 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 People's Republic of China behind it. <laughs> it's a controversial, but you got to put somebody on that. Eh? Now, it doesn't matter who you put that. Everybody has their own opinion. So yes, but uh, I want to congratulate Jason for having chosen <laughs> I, the I great Hemsman. I'm not going to take responsibility. I I just copy from the internet. So uh, well, all I'm saying that it, there should be a uh, there should be a uh, a name for the reigning dynasty from 1949 onwards, which would, is, is the People's Republic of China. <laughs> yeah, yes, that would yeah. be fine. But, uh, no. Yes, yes. But uh, it, it leaves a possibility to imagine it as the Chinese civilization party. So let's go to Joe, please. It is really quickly. I mean, one of the things that I uh, didn't notice is that while she established, uh, you know, the examination system that made more made it more merit um, meritocracy. Um, at the same time, she had an extensive spy network that actually uh, suppressed even her own family uh, in order to maintain power. Yes. And I want to say that she was not worse than the average sovereign of the time, okay? In the sense that any sovereign of the time had an intelligence that's work, okay? It was part of imperial power. And I would say that an emperor without an intelligent network would not be an intelligent emperor. So I am grateful for the question because uh, if we see things in an objective manner, her rule has been truly outstanding for the poor people. She has been an outstanding sovereign if we compare her to her main counterparts of the same dynasty. Well, 
of the dynasty of her husbands of the Tang dynasty and of other outstanding emperor of uh, other dynasty. So beyond the fact that she was the only female having created her own dynasty, by objective standards, she was a truly outstanding sovereign for the commoners. And if she has been violent and cruel to certain people, it was against the aristocracy and the rich merchant. And I think that not many people would, sh would shed tears over the rich merchant and the aristocracy that she tortured. Thank you. Uh, CK, have another comment? Yeah, I completely agree with Quan. In modern parlance, I, she promoted the dictatorship of the proletariat. <laughs> and, well. uh, yeah, she was very, very uh, you know, successful as a, as a, as a sovereign, as, a, as an emperor, outstanding, even amongst the, uh, the Tang emperors of her time. I would put her on par with the Taizong or even, you know, in, to some extent, even better than Taizong because of the reforms that she has uh, uh, instituted. For example, the reforms of the uh, imperial system, which allow the commoners to progress through the system and attain positions of uh, power and wealth, therefore transforming Chinese society from an entrenched, sort of pseudo-entrenched uh, uh, aristocracy system to a meritocratic aristocracy whereby everybody could attain, everybody meaning, meaning men, uh, could attain status and wealth by passing the imperial examinations. So it gives everybody hope in life to, uh, to make it. So that is a marvelous achievement, which was later copied by the British Empire and the French empires. Absolutely. Uh, I think that everyone here knows that the uh... British examination, examination system and the French examination, examination system have been created with the Chinese examination system in mind. Uh, and they have been created at the end of the 18th century or the beginning of the 19th century, if I remember. So uh, Fred, you have a question? This is a Fascinating story, uh, Quan Li. Thanks for putting this together. Just amazing. Um, it seems that her ruthlessness uh, and political machinations were not out of the ordinary for uh, the standards of rulers, but she was female, which makes it highly uh, unusual. And it reminds me of... Uh, of, of Lady Macbeth in a way where, you know, Lady Macbeth says, unsex me and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. So the one aspect, the important aspect of Lady Macbeth is that she was the impetus behind the cruelty that ultimately Mac, uh, Lord Macbeth fulfilled. And that was because um, Macbeth, the man, the husband, was fairly weak and vacillating, uh, and she was the impetus. And so I, I wonder, I, I get the sense that uh, as the power behind the throne, to what extent was it her dynamism and to what extent was it that she took advantage of the weakness of her husband? Or husbands. Yes. Well, I think that you you got it in the sense that when I was speaking of the three loves, the love of her father, the love of her first husband, and the love of her second husband, combined with the weakness of the second husband after his stroke in 660, uh, ma let's say opened the, the path for her, for the power graph, that's for sure, okay? I insist on the love because if Cao Zhong did not love her, she would have uh, created a regency council uh, with his cousin, with his brothers, 
with his uncles because uh, there could have been a regency council with his uncles and his brothers rather than his wife. But because uh, he loved her, because she was capable to, of course, okay, she was capable to read the official documents and to answer to the do official documents with good judgment. And she discussed the court matter with her husband in private. So there was truly a intimacy, a, con uh, a, uh, a, a closeness and a true love between the two, plus the fact that she was perfectly capable that gave rise to that miracle, of course. What, um, to what extent did her contemporaries and subsequent historians consider her a, a masculine empress by the standards of the time? Oh, well, she, she was a, must have been exceptional in that way. She has been exceptional. And from a metaphysical standpoint, because you know perfectly that beliefs and mythology are very important in the social structuration of a people or of a nation. I would say that for that metaphysical dimension, Buddhism has been outstanding uh, in assisting her to give a legitimization to her role and elevation to the imperial status. So it was a combination of factors, okay? Her own capacity to understand political machinations. Buddhism, the love of her father, her first husband, and especially of her second husband, the fact that she enjoyed the assistance of the humble background bureaucrats that she promoted because she was shrewd enough to know that she needed assistance to go against the landed nobility who look upon her with contempt and irritation, obviously. A unique and fascinating episode. Thanks again for the depth of your analysis. Thank you. Uh, CK, please. Well, Emperor Wu Zetian laid the foundations for the later glory of the Tang Dynasty during the reign of Emperor Xuanzong because the capable ministers and able men that she promoted to court stayed on and flourish and permeated themselves uh, during the reign of uh, Emperor Xuanzong and contributed tremendously to the success of, uh, of uh, Li Longji's and Emperor Xuanzong's rule, um, short of uh, the uh, catastrophic uh, Anshi Rebellion. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would like to mention another role of Buddhism uh, beyond the fact that the fact that it gave uh, legi the legitimacy to her role, uh, Buddhism facilitated a lot the relation with the Turks and with the Central Asian people too. Of course, okay. Let's not forget, in 616, General Li Jing vanquished the Eastern Gok Turn, and 643, Emperor Taizong vanquished the Western Turks. Of course, their basic religions were shamanistic religion. Uh, we agree on that. But Buddhism had also a certain influence on them. And the fact that the Tang Dynasty, and especially Wu Zetian, respected a lot Buddhism, at least on a superficial manner, politically speaking. I cannot speak about her true faith, okay? I, can, <laughs> I am not in her mind. So, but politically, she certainly used Buddhism and it gave a legitimacy to her rule within China and it facilitated the relations between the Chinese Empire and the Turkic protectorate that the Chinese Empire had between 643 and 755. And I would say that it participated to the construction, the construction within the Chinese psyche of a cosmopolitan society, okay? Uh, that overture of the mind, uh, not only in terms of territory, but in terms of mental territory, not only Confucianism, but Buddhism, Nestorianism, which is a version of Christianity, which came to Chang'an uh, in the 8th century AD, uh, of, of, 
of Islam, of course, okay, because there was a lot of contact with Islam during the Tang Dynasty. So uh, I would say that uh, the Han Dynasty uh, between the 206 BCE and 220 AD was as glorious and as powerful than the Tang Dynasty. But what is more with the Tang Dynasty is that that power also uh, brought an expansion of the mind and of the mental landscape of the Chinese people and that contributed to the continuation of the Chinese civilization afterwards. And I would say that expansion of the mental landscape is as important, if not more important, than the expansion of the land and of the power. So, uh, okay, uh, CK, please have some... Uh... Yeah, uh, just uh, some very short comment, comments. The Chinese people, if we can say a people, the, the biggest ethnic, so-called ethnic group is the Han Chinese, so-called Han Chinese. So the Han Chinese is based on the Han, taking the name from the Han Empire, the Eastern and Western Han Empires. But overseas Chinese like to call themselves people of the Tang Dynasty. So the Tang Ren or people of the Tang Dynasty. And in, uh, in North America and in, in uh, around the world, there are many Chinatowns. So Chinatowns in Chinese, in, in, in uh, Cantonese is called Tong Yan Gai and in Chinese Mandarin is called Tang Ren Jie, meaning the uh, streets or towns of the people of the Tang, of, of the Tang people. So the glory of the Tang Dynasty is such that overseas Chinese people commemorates it in their, uh, by naming their settlements after it and calling themselves by that name. Yeah, thank you, uh, CK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that, uh, that that's an interesting part because when the Chinese people, doesn't matter you are in Taiwan, Hong Kong or whatever, you know, uh, they call their, themselves Han, use the Han dynasty, right? Basically, that's the ethnic, it means your race. But when the, in Chinatown, uh, people call Tang Ren Jie, the Tang, they use Tang here, because I think that means culturally Chinese. So I think Han probably means the race, and Tang probably means the culture. That's my understanding. Uh, maybe a note on the cosmopolitan dimension of Tang Dynasty Empire. It was a, during the Tang Dynasty Empire that Japan uh, incorporated Chinese culture as the culture of the high aristocracy in Japan. And I want to name Prince Shotoku, S-H-O-T-O-K-U. And Shotoku is the, is the, the right pronunciation in uh, Japanese. And it's come from Chinese, which is Shengde Taizu. And he was born in February 7, 574. And he died in April 8, 622. He was also known as Prince Umayado or Prince Kamitsumiya, who was a regent and politician of the Asuka period in Japan, who served under Empress Suiko. He was the son of Emperor Yomei and his consort, Princess Anna Hobe no Hashito Hito, who was also Yomei's younger half-sister. So, and uh, he introduced a lot of uh, constitutional reforms uh, inspired by the Tang Dynasty uh, system. Let's not forget that the Tang Dynasty was created in six. 118 and he died in 622. I'm perfectly aware of that. But when he was ruling, it was the Sui dynasty in China. And the Sui dynasty in China was of the same control model that the Tang dynasty. The Tang dynasty was only the continuation of the Sui dynasty. And uh, the control influence of China on Japan kept on for the next two centuries and a half. And I would say that essentially, I would stop here my presentation unless there are other questions.
CK. CK. On Chang'an, today's city of uh, Western Peace, Xi'an, Xi'an city, is only one sixteenth the size of Tang Dynasty's Chang'an city. So you could see, visualize how big Chang'an was at the height of its uh, of the uh, Tang Dynasty. It's, it's sixteen times the land area of today's Xi'an city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, I would say... Uh, CK, you said the uh, Chang'an city is 16 times bigger than the... Uh, the city of Xi'an today. Oh, okay, okay. That's good to know. Yes. Um, the size of Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty was about 80 square 80 square kilometers and uh, there were no city in the whole world of that size at the time except and, and incidentally the the Tang capital of Chang'an is not the is not located on the exact site of the Han city of Chang'an because the Han city of Chang'an was destroyed and the uh, the during the Sui Dynasty, the Sui Wenti, the, the first emperor of the Sui Dynasty, decided to locate his uh, capital on a new area close to Chang'an. And uh, there was a, an architect by the name of Yu Wenjun, I believe, yeah. uh, who uh, constructed this city called Da Xingcheng, which later yeah. became Chang'an. Uh, during the Tang Dynasty. And this architect designed it to such an extent that uh, it is uh, it will be the largest city in China and at the time also the largest city in the world. Absolutely. I just checked uh, the exact size of Chang'an during the Tang Dynasty. The exact size is 84 square kilometers. On, on Japan, I mean, Japan is interesting because the Japanese are generally a people who would borrow whole scale from others once they are defeated or once they were defeated. And in the case of Japan, they were defeated. They were completely trounced by the Tang dynasty in this battle in Korea called Battle of uh, uh, or Bai Jiang Ko in, in Mandarin around 600 and I think uh, 20 Six, or, yeah. Uh, 616, no? 616 six, a, AD, whereby the Tang fleet completely annihilated the, uh, what was then called the Japanese fleet, but it was a pseudo Japanese fleet of, of all these uh, different chieftains. So after the Japanese were completely wiped out in uh, Korea, they uh, decided that uh, if you can't beat them, join them. So they sent all these, uh, Tantoshi in, in Chinese uh, Mandarin is called Qian Tang Shi, uh, missions to China, to, to Tang Dynasty, to learn the culture, the civilization, the etiquette, the governance, the political philosophy, the uh, writing, the, the religions. They imported it whole scale into Japan, into Heian, and later on Kyoto. Uh, to some to the extent that many poems of the Tang Dynasty were uh, preserved in situ. Like the, the Tang poem by, by Li Bai, which is Jing Ye Si, which everybody, every Chinese person would know, uh, was actually uh, sort of misconstrued uh, because it was, uh, it, it was uh, the, the, the stanzas were changed slightly during the Ming Dynasty and what was passed down to, to us today was this, uh, this this fabricated version during the Ming Dynasty, whereas the the original uh, poem was preserved in situ in Japan. So when the Japanese referred to the Bai's poem Jing Ye Si, the, it was different. Still, is different from the version we have today. So this is an interesting part of uh, of uh, Tang culture that was transmitted because to Japan, because the Japanese. Uh, admire it so much that they, they dare not change anything, so they preserve it wholesale and whole scale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 
And since it's a very important battle, uh, I'm, I'm grateful, uh, CK, that you mentioned that battle. The exact uh, moment of that battle was uh, the 4th and the 5th of October, 663, the battle of Pai Chiang Kao. And thanks again, CK, for mentioning that very important battle. Because, because of the Chinese victory, uh, the Japanese did not intervene in China before the end of the 16th century with the Hideyoshi uh, Toyotomi, who tried to invade China in 1598, I think so, and uh, who has been defeated by the Ming Dynasty at the time. Uh, we have another hands up, uh, T, T. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, good I'm afternoon. just wondering, hello. <laughs> I'm just wondering if what Fred had been saying about her, about Wu Zetong, I was wondering if you believe, Fred, that she herself was a sadistic and cruel person, or that perhaps she was just, she found herself in a government system in which she had to uphold the system and the style of rule or or else women wouldn't be permitted again. Um, comparing her to the Shakespearean character of Lady Macbeth, I'm, I'm assuming that you're believing that she felt that she needed to prove women as capable of brutality, cruelty, self-centeredness, et cetera, at all costs, at any consequence for anyone uh, because of weakness of a man or men. I'm trying to understand your comparison to that character. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I did not make a comment about Fred's uh, uh, comparison of Wu Tien to Lady Macbeth, but my understanding of Wu Tien, uh, maybe I'm biased, of course, but I, I see her as an outstanding person, okay, of the, of, uh, the feminine sex. Uh, she she was uh, smart, she was uh, beautiful, she was elegant, she was ambitious, okay? I would say that if there is a main character in her person, that she was ambitious. Maybe the narcissist, I, and here I'm, I'm making, uh, uh, I'm making some uh, psychology here. Maybe, maybe the narcissistic wound that her father had because he was looked down by the true aristocracy uh, created that ambition in her. Maybe, okay, it's not a hypothesis. But I think she was a nice person because she has a very fulfilling family life. Uh, her son, her grandsons truly love her. And the fact that her husband, the first one, he was an old man, okay? He was amused by her as the petulant young woman. But her second husband truly was enamored of her and was wildly in love with her. So she was a lovable person. I don't see her as a, a sadistic person, okay? She was assuming the role of a sovereign and she was shrewd enough, intelligent enough, calculating enough and ambitious enough to have used and created the tools of power she needed to be a sovereign. But fundamentally, I think she was a lovable person. And the fact that her second husband loved her so much for me was the direct proof that she was not sadistic, but a lovable person. Because once again, he could have easily created a, a regency councils with his brothers, his uncles, and his cousins. But he chose her, and she let her create her own bureaucracy by letting some humble background people to become high-ranking bureaucrats in order to be her assistant. If he did not want that, he could have easily crushed her. So he allowed her elevation to the imperial status. 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Kwang. I, I first time I heard this opinion, and I think that's that that, that that's great. You know, I I, I never hear about this, but I I, I think I, I tend to agree with you. And then that also remind me on the uh, uh the point I want to say is you you think about the period of time, right? From the Tang Dynasty, he she uh she she seized the throne, okay change the new dynasty, then in her old age, then they change back to Tang Dynasty again. But sounds like it's turmoil in political, but actually the government is pretty stable. Okay, That's only bloody or something happened during the royal family. But they, they are, she's able to retain her previous minister. And after she died, the minister worked for her, still continue to work for the next emperor. So in, in this sense, it proved, you know, she, pop, she could be a very respectable, lovable person, okay? Uh, another proof is she has four sons and two daughters. So that also proved uh, her husband really loved her because we know the uh, uh, the emperor have so many choices, and then uh, uh, you have so many uh, son and a daughter from one woman. It's unusual. So I stop here, and we have a lot of hands up. And then yeah. let's go through uh, to okay. before I go. Uh, sorry, okay. Jason. Uh, sorry, yeah. Jason. Before going to the next person, uh, Fred just wrote a commentary that I want to say. He wrote that maybe the Shakespearean character to compare Wu Zetian with would not be Lady Macbeth, but Queen Elizabeth the first. And I agree. I, I I'm a little surprised. How come nobody talk about the Catherine the Great? I always think about Catherine the Great because both of them are oh have a lot of lovers. So that's the part I'm interested. In. <laughs> Very interesting rapprochement, Jason. Very interesting rapprochement. I agree. Okay, so that's we have another hands up. Okay, look, guys, we are not going to talk about her love story. So uh, probably next time. Okay, so we have a CK Feu and AP and Madeline. Let's call this order. Then we probably have to conclude for the day. Well, actually, I have like uh, three short points. I think uh, Queen Elizabeth the first is not really the comparison. It's more Catherine, yeah, Catherine the Great. Uh, that should be compared to Zetian because both were continental powers. Though both rule over continental powers, whereas Queen Elizabeth the uh, first was ruling only uh, over part of a very small island. So that's not comparable uh, in that sense. Um, in the case of uh, Wu Zetian's influence, I have to say that uh, apparently, according to some Japanese. Uh, friends that I had, and uh, they told me that uh, the, the imperial family of Japan was or still is subconsciously influenced by Wu Zetian in the sense that, uh, that they adopted many of the styles of the reigning titles that was first espoused by her. For example, her titles could be very long. For example, one of them is this Ci Shi Yue Gu Jin Lun Sheng Shen Huang Di. The Japanese also like really long titles. So that is uh, supposedly a relic of, uh, of, of Wu Zetian's uh, influence on Japan. And, and lastly, uh, even modern Japan has uh, uh, adopted Tang Dynasty's uh, um, names, perhaps not even knowing it. If you go to Japan today and you look at their train stations or their subway stations, they are all called Eki. And in... Uh, in, in if you look at the Chinese characters, it's it's e, which is a which is a horse station literally, and the reason why it is the train stations are called horse stations was because when the Kanto Shi went over to the Tang Dynasty to Chang'an, they saw many horse stations couriers along the way where uh, communications around the empire was uh, was uh, instituted. And they thought it was a brilliant idea, so they brought it back to Japan. And all the stations in Japan for communications and, and transport reasons are were henceforth called eki. So that's a uh, 
a uh, result of uh, Tang Dynasty influence on Japan, even up to today. Okay, so uh, Fei Wu, please. Yeah, uh, Wu Zetian was not cruel at all, but extremely kind. She was not a nice person in the sense that she was a pushover or a people pleaser, but she was extremely kind in, this, in the sense that she had the best interest of all people in heart. All those four stories about her were projections of the writers themselves, the characters of the writers themselves, or for dramatic effects. Thank you. Thank you, Vail. Uh, so, AP? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Um, my question is actually separate from this, but I guess she's most known, uh, whether it's rewritten or not, for uh, supposedly killing her own children, right? That's what the speaker before was just talking about, that they made up sort of... Uh, uh, a way to defame her. Does anybody have an opinion about that? That isn't my question. Um, but uh, my question is actually about Empress uh, Sushi and how Sushi never really took on the role of uh, Emperor in the same way. And she ruled behind a curtain physically. And I wondered whether or not uh, Wu Zetian uh, had any physical barriers when she was similar to Sushi speaking to men uh, and in holding court, did she actually have some sort of modesty uh, between her and people or was she allowed to be openly physically in front of people when she was convening with them? That's the question. Yeah. Uh, the Tang Dynasty was much, much more open-minded in terms of a culture and of social relations than the Qing dynasty, <laughs> even if the Tang dynasty was before and many centuries before the Qing dynasty. Once again, the Tang dynasty has been the most cosmopolitan, if not the most open-minded, at least one of the most open-minded eras of the Chinese history. Uh, because uh, of, uh, you know, when the people reach uh, power and glory, they are much more easygoing and much more relaxed than w when people are more uh, are weaker. Okay, weaker people more often are more uh, close-minded and careful than uh, glorious and powerful people. So there was the power and the glory, and there was the influence from Central Asia, uh, where women were treated as equal to men, and uh, that permeated a lot the Tang uh, Empire uh, mentality. Uh, what was possible for Wu Zetian was not possible for Su Tzu uh, a thousand years later, uh, because uh, first, uh, Su Tzu was not as widely loved by her husband than Wu Zetian was loved by her husband. Okay, first, let's never forget that. Okay, I insist on that. Emperor Cao Zhong could have very easily crushed Wu Zetian, attempt to, gra to grab power if he did not love her so widely. That was the first factor. And second, the Qing dynasty was not as open-minded than the Tang dynasty. It's, it's obvious, okay? The Qing dynasty at the time of Tzu Tzu, because I want to be fair, the first two centuries of the Qing Dynasty were, were glorious, but the last the last century was not glorious at all, and they were quite close-minded. And it was the worst version of Confucianism that was active during that time. So it was impossible in during in that within that close-mindedness of the worst version of Confucianism in the 19th century for a woman to grab power directly as Wu Zetian has done uh, in the seventh century uh, CE. So 
and uh, and uh, that's my opinion on that. Okay, about the fact that she she was accused of having murdered her own daughter, her first daughter, uh, in the machination accusing Empress Wong, uh, the, the the Empress of Kaohsiung at the time, for having poisoned her or killed her to uh, to get rid of Empress Wong. Uh, I don't have a definite proof for that, but I think it's a slander. But that's only my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I I just like to come up because uh, I'm very happy we today we our discussion bring to a uh, well probably kind of like uh, apology for uh, <laughs> Wu Zetian uh, and a lot of story we heard and you know, from the soap opera probably not true because of the traditional Confucian society would like to uh, uh, put a slander on her. So we don't know, you know, we don't know if it's true or not true. Yeah, you know? but uh, we have a Madeline and the CK. Yes, um, let's see. So the, the earlier mention that, um, that her, the time of her reign was a sort of, uh, era within the Tang dynasty, and then that resumed. I remembered something from a much previous meetup with this group that, um, and I'm not even certain it's from the same era that it would apply to. It was about the succession of dynasties and how they went in a cycle of five with, you know, particular emblems assigned to them and everything. And at one point that got disrupted and there were there have been arguments ever since about which ones were correct subsequently. And I'm wondering, uh, first of all, if you know what I'm, if I've made myself clear what I'm talking about and if this was that interruption. I I think that's uh, 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 during the, this period, the Han Dynasty, that's on the peak of the uh, the five elements in cycle, okay. But uh, uh, during this time in the Tang Dynasty, I understand it is this kind of the theory, the cycle of the theory, five elements in the cycle, one kill the other one, or one uh, give birth to another one, is not that popular. That, that's my understanding. So uh, at least in my uh, reading, I don't see much about this. But probably Huang or anybody have different opinion. That I just express my opinion. Um, I don't have anything to add to that. I consider Jason's answer as being complete. <laughs> no. Okay, so let's have a CK. Then we probably can uh, uh, conclude for today. CK, please. Yeah, I, I, I find the the comparison between Wu Zhe Zetian and the Empress Dowager Cixi problematic because they are not firstly comparable. First, uh, the reason I said that is, is because Wu Zhe Tian Wu Zhao was an educated literati. She was educated. She was uh, raised for greatness by her father. She was given the same education as men of her um, of aristocracy. Whereas Cixi uh, was of the Ye He Nala clan which was a, uh, a foe of the ruling Ai Xin Jie Luo clan in uh, the Qing dynasty. She was not really that educated, and certainly her, edu if, ed her education, if uh, it exists at all, was not uh, sufficient to confront the challenges that China faced in the 19th century. Um, she was, I mean, Cixi was uh, in a position of what the British would call managing decline, whereas Wu Zetian was in the position of managing a rising power. So those situations are not comparable. And I think one last thing, which is very important, Wu Zetian did not see herself as being inferior to anybody. She did not see herself as being inferior to men. She did not see herself as being inferior to her... Uh, husband. She did not see herself as being inferior to her courtiers. But I think Cixi, because of the propagation of a neo-Confucianist thinking, 
even though she was in power, she dare not assume full control, but always had to rule behind the scenes or uh, you know reign behind the uh, bamboo uh, curtain, as they say, because she did not have the same level of confidence as Wu Zetian had. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Very right. Yeah. Thank you, CK. Okay. Uh... Huang, you have anything to say before we close this today's session? Well, first, thank you, Jason, for having prepared the maps and the charts. Uh, very, they were very useful and very right. And thank you for to everyone to having come today. Uh, it was a marvelous discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Kwang, and uh, for the wonderful uh, history account. And then uh, next week we go back to the. Uh, Zhuangzi philosophy, and I need to finish uh, the chapter seven. That's the inner chapter of the last section of the Zhuangzi's inner chapter. And then we will continue you know, to the Christmas, uh, to December. So then we take a break and uh, we are going to restart um, uh, next year. So uh, next thing we will, I would like to do is uh, finish the Zhuangzi. I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, history of uh, uh, Chinese philosophy, uh, still from Feng Yulan, and he has another book, not the short history, it's a long history. So I'm going through this one more time, and then uh, uh, welcome to join us, continue, and uh, we will do the same thing, and then and I will base on this as a main uh, serial, and then uh, I believe Kuang will be happy to come back from time to time and talk about some historical background, literature background, philosophy background. And anybody want to uh, join us to bring some Asian philosophy, bring some color, different opinion, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, all this kind of thing. You are very welcome to join us uh, because we are here to uh, share with our different opinion and then uh, enjoy our weekend. So. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.